So, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and what you used to do. My name is Greg Thielman and uh, I retired in 2002 from a 25-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service and the job from which I retired was the director of the Office of Strategic Proliferation and Military Affairs in the Intelligence Bureau of the State Department. And uh, talk a little bit about the, one of your last months, August, is when you start to see a lot of this public relations campaign start to drum up and what you know, some of your reactions were to that. My office was responsible, uh, among other things, for analyzing uh, all of the intelligence coming into the U.S. on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. So that was uh, really a constant of, of the job during my entire tour in the Intelligence Bureau. But there was definitely, after 9-11 and in the latter part of 2001, there was an uh, intensification of high-level interest in how we would characterize uh, developments uh, in Iraq uh, of unconventional weapons programs. And uh, we did a number of reports uh, doing our best to characterize Iraqi military capabilities and, and uh, their programs in uh, nuclear, biological, chemical, and, uh, and missile programs. What was really marked uh, for me was the way Vice President Cheney's August speech to the VFW uh, constituted what was for me really a declaration of war. And it was uh, characterized by language which was, I would say, almost completely unrelated to what the actual intelligence uh, coming in said about Iraqi conditions. It was. Uh, hyped and, and expressed in, in an alarmist way that was really not an accurate and faithful rendering of what the professional intelligence analysts were saying, but it was a signal, at least to me, uh, as a retiring uh, government worker, that the administration had decided to go to war and uh, had therefore dispensed with uh, an effort to educate the American people about the realities of what was happening in Iraq and instead was interested in so inflating and distorting what was happening in Iraq as to make it appear the, the gravest threat to the United States, more grave than, for example, uh, the nuclear weapons program of, uh, of North Korea or the, the uh, evolving nuclear weapons program of Iran. And it was that um, total lack of perspective and, and distortion of what was really going on that, that alarmed me greatly in August. Now, we had assumed that there was uh, a lot of, uh, there were a lot of high-level discussions going on and that, and that uh, Secretary Colin Powell was representing the forces of reason in an administration that had a very strong ideological bent and obviously a, a group of people uh, represented by Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl and others who had been lobbying for war against Iraq for some time. But we, we did not have an indication, or at least I did not have an indication or feel uh, until that Cheney speech of how far advanced the planning and thinking about war against Iraq was. We were in the Intelligence Bureau and our job was to analyze incoming foreign intelligence, so we were not um, we were not in the best position to know all the twists and turns of evolving U.S. policy. But that was to me the, the, uh, the warning flag about what was to come. Then it was, it was quickly followed by a number of things which uh, distressed me greatly. Uh, in, in my last month of government service, the President introduced uh, what had been top secret uh, uh, compartmented information on the interception of aluminum tubes bound for uh, Iraq. And he presented it in a way which, again, I thought was uh, uh, a completely inaccurate distortion of the state of analysis within the U.S. government on the meaning of those tubes. Um, at the same time, uh, Condoleezza Rice and President Bush started using the image of, uh, of a mushroom cloud 
to imply that Iraqi nuclear capability was what much more advanced than the professional analysts were reporting. So there was really one thing after another, and then I guess the uh, uh, one of the last and, and most dramatic things in this in this uh, series of, uh, of exaggerated and alarmist uh, reports was the president's statement about the uranium from Africa in his January 2003 State of the Union message. And this uh, hit me as a particular thunderbolt because uh, uh, once I r realized that what he was referring to was something that uh, we had uh, assured the secretary was a very dubious report back in March of 2002 in the Intelligence Bureau's comment on this issue, I realized that not only was the president uh, conveying sensitive intelligence from foreign intelligence services, which was highly unusual to, to quote a British report as if we had no comment on it other than to present it as fact, uh, but beyond that to, to put the, the kind of weight that he did on that report, combining it with the, the aluminum tube story distortion uh, to address the most worrisome of all of the categories of weapons of mass destruction, that is the nuclear account, uh, I, I thought was, was uh, simply unjustified and in light of uh, the use of this kind of, of comment to build a case for war was, was really a, a crime against the American people. And, and during this, this time period, are you looking at reading both the Washington Post and after, you know, starting in August up until the war resolution was passed in October, are you reading the newspapers and seeing and, and how would you kind of characterize how the press was performing in that time period? I was not happy with the way the press was performing, but uh, obviously uh, the, the press was trying to report on a subject that, that dealt with the official secrets. It was a, a very difficult thing to report on. And uh, I, can, I can say with some pride, I guess, that, uh, that the people in government who were sworn to, uh, to safeguard those secrets were basically doing that. And most people were not talking to the press about classified matters. Uh, the unfortunate thing was, of course, that the leadership of the government was talking about these matters and doing it in a way which was dishonest. And that puts uh, the members of the bureaucracy in a, in a very odd position, and, and you, you, you find a press that really has to dig things out and, and read official reports very carefully to look for words that are changed uh, to, to try to find out from sources uh, get some idea from, from sources what they need to uh, apply additional scrutiny to. And I'm afraid that my overall judgment is that the press did not do a very good job. The classic instance of that is the way they treated the aluminum tube story. The, the president, uh, in commenting on these aluminum tubes that Iraq was procuring, gave everyone the impression that the only use for these tubes could possibly be the nuclear weapons program of Iraq. And that was the impression he left by the words in his address to the United Nations General Assembly in September. But just in case anyone didn't get it, Condoleezza Rice, his national security advisor, said that explicitly. This is the only thing that these tubes could, could be used for. Now, this is being said publicly at the very time that there was a uh, uh, a deep division of opinion within the U.S. government. The agency that had the most expertise to apply to this issue, the Department of Energy, said exactly the opposite, that these tubes were not suited for use uh, in centrifuges to enrich uranium. And my bureau, the State Department's Intelligence Bureau, after listening to, uh, to uh, long debates and, and a lot of analysis of the actual uh, metal that had been uh, intercepted, found that Department of Energy analysis to be very convincing. We went to the, to the uh, experts directly at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, for example, listened to their explanations. We looked at the alternative explanations for why Iraq was importing uh, so many aluminum tubes. And in fact, there was a plausible explanation, which we now know was in fact the case. They were importing these uh, aluminum tubes to be used for the casing of, of conventional artillery rockets. So we not only 
uh, had expert witness that this kind of high strength aluminum was not what was needed for uranium centrifuges, but we had a plausible explanation of what was being done. So that was, that was the, uh, the background within, within the government for those who, who knew these things, but the press simply took almost verbatim uh, what the president had said and accepted without much analysis that this was going into the nuclear weapons program. When they did get wind of uh, the disagreements inside the government, they basically bought off on the senior CIA's leadership's explanation that the disagreements about the majority opinion were, were really kind of eccentric, uh, an eccentric minority point of view, giving the public no idea that the real expertise in the government happened to be part of this dissenting opinion. So th that, the, that the, the press did not really pick up on this uh, in a timely way allowed the public to be, to be deceived by the government and, and uh, for a, a strong impression to be formed, which was very hard then to uh, disabuse the public of, that the most important category of, of uh, weapons of mass destruction programs was being actively pursued by the Iraqi government, that the program that had been dismantled in the 1990s was being reconstituted. And, and that line on the part of the senior CIA leadership, and even more on the part of the political leadership of the U.S., was adhered to throughout, including in February when Secretary Powell gave a speech to the United Nations Security Council, all the way up to the March 17th speech by, by President Bush. Again and again, they implied that there was an acute nuclear danger here when, uh, as the UN inspectors returning to Iraq gained more and more evidence we knew was uh, not the case. And more and more doubts were raised about the government's, the government's account, but the press was very slow to pick up on those doubts, very slow to pick up on what the UN inspectors were finding on the ground. And, and that spurious case made by the government was basically uh, accepted by most of the press throughout the lead up to the war. If you look on uh, October 4th and the CIA uh, released this uh, declassified document, they acknowledged that there was a debate. Some reporters like Jonathan Landay of Knight Ritter and Julian Borger picked up on that and followed up and were able to talk to uh, Department of Energy uh, officials. So can you speak to, you know, that uh, it seems like there were some people reporting on it but not a critical mass of the New York Times, Washington that's right, and, and, and I think uh, Jonathan Landay and, and, and I'm those... I'm I'm going to be uh, not including my question, so... That's... Yeah. Jonathan Landay and, and several, uh, several others did report on this in an in a impressive uh, uh, and responsible journalistic fashion, and that actually makes everyone else look worse, because uh, they show that even though you have great difficulty in getting at sensitive information that is relevant to a a highly important public debate, they were able to basically uh, crack the story. That raises the question then, what happened to the rest of the press? What happened to television journalists for not following up on those leads, for not understanding the significance of what they were writing in these stories? Um, it, it actually became part of uh, the television press coverage of this matter in the summer of 2003 after the invasion, after uh, we were occupying the country and Americans were dying every day, then the television news sort of picked up on that story that they could have followed in the fall of, of 2002 when it would have played or could have played a major role in the nation deciding whether or not it had to go to war when it did. And you, you look at the time period after uh, October 11th and a lot of journalists I've talked to kind of take this real politic attitude of, well, we knew they were going to go to war anyway. It was just a matter of how many allies we were going to have. So you have this ignoring of uh, Armitage saying, you know, uh, th there was a debate. And, you know, Peter Jennings had a 20 to 30 word soundbite, but you also had on March 7th, uh, Albara Day coming out with these tubes. And that was the same day they gave the 10-day ultimatum. So, I mean, the, do you see that Generally, a lot of this evidence that was coming out at the UN after 
the inspectors were on the ground that a lot of these leads were not being followed up on as well, even when it's in the public domain. I, I very much believe that um, you know the intelligence committees of, of both houses of Congress had access to the entire intelligence community after the, the national intelligence estimate was released at the beginning of the month. There was both a classified version and an unclassified version. It was possible for them to talk about this uh, in open sessions uh, in front of cameras. And what basically happened was that the, this all-important document that had been requested by the Congress and hurriedly put together by the administration was, was given uh, very quick and uh, not very comprehensive scrutiny by the Congress before the Congress fulfilled its constitutional obligation to, in effect, uh, declare war or give the president, uh, delegate to the president uh, the, the issue of going to war. So I think it's very revealing that when you had, for example, my intelligence bureau in writing, uh, in a very conspicuous and comprehensive way, disagreeing with one of the most important contentions of that national intelligence estimate, that as far as I know, no one from my bureau was ever called by any member of Congress to explain or elaborate on that position. To me, that, that is uh, a prima facie case that the Congress, uh, just as the press did, uh, failed to, to really delve into the issue to the degree that they should have, given the gravity of, of the issue's concern. Okay. And um, that, when, you, when you have this administration driving the news cycle, saying Iraq is the biggest threat, could the press have dug in and see that, well, no, actually North Korea or Iran may be a, the bigger threat? This is something I don't think you need a lot of sources uh, to, to explore. I mean, uh, the... What is, it, I'm sorry, what, what's it? it? You do not need uh, to get government intelligence analysts to reveal classified information to make some comparative statements about Iran uh, and Iraq and North Korea. These three countries were labeled as the, the axis of evil by President Bush. The U.S. government had made a lot of statements about concerns concerning Iran and North Korea, public statements. They had said that uh, the United States government believes that Iran is building, uh, is working on a nuclear weapons program. And it was doing so without the constraints that, that uh, Iraq was under, without nearly the constraints that Iraq was under. Uh, likewise, it was the official position of the U.S. government that North Korea already had sufficient uh, nuclear weapons, uh, or I'm sorry, sufficient fissile material for uh, some number of nuclear weapons at the same time that we were talking about Iraq might have sufficient fissile material within seven to nine years for a nuclear weapon. Um, one doesn't have to dig very much there. One just has to put statements side by side and, and say, if in fact, and North Korea had just told us a few days before the congressional vote that yes, they were uh, uh, using uh, uranium enrichment to work on nuclear weapons. They admitted that to us, which was uh, certainly contrary to the spirit of, of uh, an agreement the U.S. had with the North Koreans uh, in 1994. So, uh, and that, by the way, was not shared by the executive branch with the Congress of the United States until a day or two after the vote on, on Iraq. But the statements of the official U.S. government assessments about what was going on in Iran, what was going on in North Korea, were all publicly available. All one had to do was to look at those statements look at, at the, the degree of concern about Iraq and put in perspective where the, where the most imminent and immediate and uncontrolled threats to U.S. security were. Uh, it really wasn't done. Now, if you put your, um, yourself in the shoes of uh, the press and you hear statements like, this is the only possible use for something, it seems to be kind of a, a flaw in critical thinking. And, can you think of any times if you were a journalist and, and have your science background without your knowledge that you would have been able to point out, well, that just doesn't you know, make, make logical sense in the face of it? it it's hard for journalists, most of whom do not have technical backgrounds, to, to make that judgment. In fact, uh, even for... for I'm the, sorry, what, what judgment? It, it, it's hard for journalists uh, to uh, make... Uh, 
technical judgments about matters like is this kind of high strength aluminum suitable for a nuclear weapons program or not. Um, it is actually even difficult for people who are working professionally on the issue to, to uh, know uh, easily uh, about, about these programs. But when there are indications, as there were in this case, that uh, even in the unclassified version, while it was uh, a little bit misleading the way they put it, it said most analysts believe that this is going into the nuclear weapons program. Well, I think you know, a skeptical journalist should then ask, well, what do the other analysts believe and why do they not agree with the majority? Because most of the opinions in a national intelligence estimate are consensus opinion. Everyone basically sees things in this way. When you, when you see a formula like most analysts believe, then there is a different view by other analysts. And that should always be a, a, a prod to, to journalists and members of Congress for that matter to try to dig into the reasons that some do not see it that way. This, this, this did not trigger the right kind of uh, journalistic suspicions at the time that they were being played with. And, and that is, in fact, I think, what happened. And another sense that I see uh, in journalism, they, they're reporting events day to day without looking at patterns of behavior, even patterns of rhetoric. And as an intelligence analyst, when you look at the patterns of behavior and patterns of rhetoric, what type of things do you see in, in the motivations of the Bush administration? I thought the, the pattern of rhetoric of the Bush administration was very revealing. For example, they very skillfully uh, and, uh, and deceptively referred to Iraq and Al-Qaeda in the same sentence again and again in talking about the threats facing the United States. Different faces of the same evil. President Bush claimed uh, after our invasion of Iraq that we had defeated an ally of Saddam Hussein. Uh, again and again, the association, there was a merging, a morphing of Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. These are two evil figures. The, these are two enemies of the United States. And fighting against uh, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is like fighting against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. It was this juxtaposition and the skill with which the public was essentially confused and misled about this connection that one can chart in looking at speech after speech, talking point after talking point of President Bush, Vice President Cheney, Secretary Rumsfeld, Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. Again and again they were using this, this sleight of hand to give the public the impression that we went into Iraq because of 9-11 and because of that war against, against terrorism. Um, polls for a long time, and maybe even to this day, still show that the, the public bought into this deceit. They, they basically, uh, the majority believed that there was a connection between uh, Saddam Hussein and 9-11. Now we know, of course, that the bipartisan uh, reporting from the 9-11 Commission, from the Senate Select Intelligence Committee, Every time there's a bipartisan group that exhaustively looks at this issue, they conclude, as did the 9-11 Commission, that there was no evidence of collaborative operational relationship between these two organizations. President Bush himself has acknowledged that Saddam Hussein was not involved in the 9-11 attacks. But now, of course, the damage has been done. The public had that impression. It was a very important part of the public's willingness to send uh, its sons and daughters uh, into war. Uh, and that to me is one of the classic cases of the way rhetorical patterns have misled people. On the, on the specific issues of weapons of mass destruction, one can find it again and again as well. The raising of the mushroom cloud to uh, associate in the public mind a nuclear danger with Iraq when in fact the nuclear weapons program that the Iraqis had been working on prior to the first Gulf War had been very effectively dismantled by the UN during the 1990s and we had gained a great deal of information about who the people were responsible for that program, how they had done these things, which, which kind of approaches they had used and that allowed us to, to track this uh, fairly closely even when the inspectors were not in the country. 
Once the inspectors had returned, we were able to resolve some of the remaining ambiguities that had, had uh, started to uh, fester with the absence of the inspectors. But those resolutions of doubt, the uh, removal of, of ambiguous information, had no effect on the administration at all. They never referred or shared with the public the kind of uh, information that the UN inspectors were uh, providing uh, to the U.S. and, and other countries uh, once they had returned to Iraq in November of, of 2002. And again, you see this pattern. You see a pattern of from the first week that the inspectors had returned, the administration was denigrating the uh, effectiveness of the inspectors. Uh, if you look at Secretary Rumsfeld, he's particularly scathing of the fecklessness of the inspectors. N nothing, you know, they won't work, it will be ineffective. They just hit the ground and already the U.S. government was, was condemning their, their lack of effectiveness. Whereas, in fact, it was the inspectors who could check up on some of the, uh, of the concerns that we legitimately raised. What is the new construction we see at facilities formerly associated with nuclear weapons? Uh, where are those aluminum tubes going? I mean, interestingly, the, when the inspectors hit the ground, they were all ready to offer the tentative judgment in January. The tubes were not going into the nuclear weapons program. And then they uh, uh, delivered their final uh, conclusions about it early in March, again, before we invaded. But, the, but those conclusions were completely ignored by the U.S. government because we weren't interested in, in, in that information. It, it appears... Uh, evident now from uh, some of the things released by the press that uh, we were already informing countries like Saudi Arabia of the details of, of uh, our intention of going to war in January. So obviously as, as the UN inspectors were coming up with important uh, information in uh, later in January, in February, and in March, uh, it made no difference to the U.S. government. And couldn't you just look at the public statements of the Bush administration and see patterns of, of them just using the UN as a pretext or a multilateral, multilateral cover to go in? And what's your sense? Did they really even want the inspectors to go back and to work? Well, it's very interesting to look at the pattern uh, of, of rhetoric about the UN uh, voiced by this administration. Uh, for one thing, uh, the first uh, two years of the Bush administration was one example of a contemptuous attitude about, about the United Nations as an institution and about international treaties from Kyoto to the International Criminal Court to uh, uh, arms control treaties, the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty, uh, the uh, anti-personnel landmines uh, treaty. In one instance after another, the administration showed that it was contemptuous about uh, uh, multilateral efforts, about, uh, about international law, and so it was, it was rather odd and one might say refreshing to see a, a new interest in a UN Security Council resolutions uh, being carried out in, in the case of Iraq uh, and, and a willingness to the U.S. to enforce those resolutions uh, uh, militarily if necessary. Of course, uh, one did not have to dig very deeply to find out that, that, that this was basically uh, Secretary Powell convincing the President that he had to go to the United Nations if, in fact, he wanted to uh, to uh, pursue this issue uh, successfully in the end, you at least had to make uh, uh, an effort to go to the United Nations to get international support for it. So there was a, there was a window there in which uh, the U.S. was actually playing uh, uh, as a member of the U.N. and playing the U.N. game. Of course, we were not able to convince a majority of Security Council members to, uh, to authorize military action in March when we wished to take it, so we did it anyway. So do you, do you think that the press should have seen a, a sort of hypocrisy of disdain towards the UN and then all of a sudden let's use, use the UN to get this authorization? Well, that I think the press did see. Uh, and I'm sorry, what did the I, I think the press uh, uh, was aware of, of the hypocrisy of the administration. They, the, the press, uh, I don't think, believed that uh, the administration had already, uh, had, had suddenly uh, seen the light on the importance of international action. But uh, I don't think the press really um, used their skepticism uh, to energize their pursuit of, of what was going on underneath the surface. And uh, particularly television media gave too much credence to the, to the surface story of the administration that 
this administration was so interested in UN Security Council resolutions being, being fulfilled, unlike, let's say, Security Council resolutions regarding Israel and Palestine, that we had to, uh, to uh, send the nation to war in order to enforce them. I think the, the press should have taken the contradictions and, and used that to ask the difficult questions about what's really going on here and provide some analysis of what's really going on. And uh, I, I see generally using the scientific method of, of forming your own hypothesis and then asking those questions. So, you know, if you were to form a hypothesis and then how would, what questions would you have wanted to ask to this administration regarding international law or their treatment at the UN? Well, I think the, the administration could have been uh, asked uh, more energetically uh, why the UN Security Council resolutions on Iraq were different in terms of their impact and importance than other UN Security Council resolutions. Why uh, non-proliferation efforts were so important in, in, in the case of Iraq, but uh, it was... Uh, permissible to basically uh, sabotage efforts to get a verification protocol to the Biological Weapons Convention that, uh, that the, the U.S. torpedoed after uh, many years of, of international efforts to get that. Or why, if we were so concerned about the, the, uh, the image of uh, mushroom clouds and so forth, we would just uh, let the uh, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty sit in the, in the Senate and not even ask for uh, reconsideration of the ratification of that treaty. Uh, those kind of questions didn't seem to be uh, really pursued. Or uh, to, to get, use another example, if, if we were so concerned about, uh, about nuclear weapons and, and the possibility that Iraq could get a nuclear weapon uh, within the decade, uh, where was uh, our concern about the uh, 10,000 nuclear weapons that the U.S. and the Russians had. Why, why did we in, in, uh, just negotiate in the Moscow Treaty an agreement that uh, would uh, have no verification mechanism to it, an agreement that would, on the second that was implemented, go out, of, go out of effect? I mean, all of those fatal flaws of the Moscow Treaty were not examined in the context of an administration that was allegedly obsessed with the nuclear threat. And so go back to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Were there, my understanding is that there were actually provisions in there for the United States and everyone that has nuclear weapons to eventually get rid of them. And are we even doing that? The nuclear non-proliferation treaty was essentially a, a deal between two categories of countries. Those countries which already had uh, nuclear weapons in 1968, and there were five countries, and those which did not. The, uh, the, the trade-off was a very simple one. For those countries that did not have nuclear weapons, uh, their commitment was not to develop them, not to enable other countries to develop them. And for the countries that had nuclear weapons, their commitment was to move expeditiously to get rid of those nuclear weapons. And so it was that latter commitment, the Article VI commitment of the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, for nuclear weapon states to move expeditiously to get rid of their nuclear weapons. That is what other countries in the world uh, look at the United States and say, you're not keeping your end of the bargain. You're spending all this time talking about the importance of no other country getting nuclear weapons. But there you sit, more than a decade after the Cold War is over, with, uh, with five to 6,000 nuclear warheads uh, that, can, that can quickly uh, be uh, used to uh, to attack other countries and uh, inherently uh, contain the, the possibility of, uh, of ending human life on the planet Earth. And it, there seems to be you know, almost this cover story of stockpile stewardship at the Department of Energy. You know, do, is it your sense that that's really intended to develop uh, bunker busters and mini nukes? And you know, is there also a hypocrisy in the United States that here we are actually developing new nuclear weapons? The stockpile stewardship program, the Department of Energy, is is basically a, a, a program to spend a lot of money that allows the United States to retain high confidence in the reliability of its nuclear arsenal without nuclear testing. 
but in a way now we have the worst of all possible worlds. We have uh, we're spending a lot of money on the on the uh, uh, the on this program to assure the reliability of nuclear weapons, so we don't have to test. But we're refraining from ratifying the treaty that says we won't test. And at the same time, we are uh, researching new programs to develop new nuclear weapons that that presumably would require testing at some future point. So we're undermining. Uh, in, in the worst possible way, the, the effort to con persuade other countries not to develop nuclear weapons by saying the United States, which is, has uh, already detonated uh, well over a thousand nuclear weapons uh, in the atmosphere uh, under Earth uh, uh, in virtually every environment, uh, has to, for its own security, retain the right to do this at some time in the future. What could possibly be worse for, uh, in an effort to convince other countries that they do not need to, to uh, aspire to nuclear weapons tests? And so when you, you look at also the, the rhetoric of, of calling our nuclear weapons nuclear deterrence versus weapons of mass destruction, can you talk about the, even the rhetoric difference? Well, there's a lot of uh, games played by the, the, uh, the rhetoric of uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, Nuclear deterrence is is a, a, an honorable and a, and a, and legitimate uh, mechanism that we nuclear powers use. But uh, uh, if any uh, non-nuclear power is aspiring to nuclear weapons, uh, it cannot be for deterrence or cannot be for defense. It must be provocative and uh, and a destructive of international uh, tranquility and and order. I would much prefer uh, an approach by the United States in which which said, we cannot turn history back. We have, in effect, created a monster in the nuclear arms race, and we're doing our best to, to get a grip on that monster to eventually make it go away. And it is in this knowledge of, of the, the terrible potential of these weapons that we are pursuing uh, nuclear nonproliferation so other countries don't make the same mistakes that the U.S. and the Soviet Union made and that, that uh, we're doing everything we can to reduce the number of weapons and to, uh, to make them less readily accessible to control the, the material that goes into these weapons, and that we urge other countries to join us in this planetary imperative to get a grip on nuclear dangers. That's what our posture should be. But instead, we use a, a very uh, ambiguous signal by, in effect, saying that w there are rules for us and because we're good and just, uh, those rules only apply to us. And everyone else is suspect, and, uh, and they have to have more effective constraints on them. And when you look at the context of Iraq and Israel, was there a motivation of Saddam Hussein to uh, produce defensive weapons because of Israel? Well, I think it's, it's really a, a statement of the obvious to, to point out that uh, since Israel uh, has nuclear weapons, uh, and probably chemical and biological weapons as well. Since Israel has every category of weapons of mass destruction, uh, that is something in which uh, Israel's neighbors have, have uh, legitimate concerns about. And one can justify Israeli weapons uh, however one wants in terms of uh, the Israeli insecurity about living in a very dangerous neighborhood and other states which don't recognize uh, Israel's right to exist and so forth. But the point is, uh, if we if we say that countries that have not signed the nuclear nonproliferation treaty are are on the wrong side of the law and in somehow a rogue category, uh, if, if they have nuclear weapons program, then it's pretty hard for us to say, except for Israel, who hasn't signed the nuclear nonproliferation treaty and has and has a great number of nuclear weapons, but somehow that's over here and that that's all right. That kind of that kind of uh, double standard is seen as gross hypocrisy by most countries in the world. Okay. And, um, uh, the, um, now, when you take a talk in terms of non-proliferation of, of uh, weapons of mass destruction, and there seem to be this connection that's being made that if we have a military intervention, that's going to disarm Iraq. And in the context of what the Pentagon is even saying about Gulf War Syndrome, that we hit these chemical weapons uh, bunkers and then there's a plume of smoke that, that causes the Gulf War Syndrome, there seems to be a lack of connection there. Like, 
how you know when, when you listen to a military intervention for disarming what do you think I think it's it's pretty clear to me that that military intervention for disarmament is the worst possible way to do it uh, there are times when perhaps that is the only alternative we have but it's very uh, startling to realize that in the case of the first Gulf War uh, Desert Storm that it was the UN inspectors uh, uh, in the in the years after the war that destroyed far more uh, weapons and uh, far more effectively dismantled the the programs for weapons of mass destruction than that vast armada of military forces that was that was uh, utilized in Desert Storm and of course when the UN inspectors did it when when under UN supervision the Iraqis destroyed these weapons themselves or the UN destroyed them uh, with Iraqi cooperation you do not have the same kind of side effects uh, and, and uh, toxic release and other things that, that happened in some cases during, during the war. So uh, trying to, to, uh, to get rid of, of uh, programs of concern and weapons of concern by violence is a very bad and dangerous way to do it. It doesn't mean that, uh, that sometimes one does not have to either threaten military force or utilize nuclear force when, uh, when other countries are uh, in violation of international commitments. But it has to be realized that that's a very undesirable and high cost uh, way to, uh, to uh, find a solution to the problem. And when you have the uh, Bush administration saying that the UN inspectors are totally uh, ineffective and, and feckless and whatnot, and what was there intelligence even within the United States government proving the effectiveness that Iraq was, you know, such and such percent disarmed, or their capabilities were disarmed and destroyed? And I think the line of, of argumentation used by Secretary Rumsfeld, in particular, about the the fecklessness of the UN inspectors was completely contrary to. Uh, the majority view inside the, the U.S. government about people who were familiar with the experience of U.N. inspectors during the 1990s. There were unresolved issues. There were open issues about, about biological weapons and chemical weapons that uh, we could not account for uh, gaps in, in records that uh, uh, when we knew of everything had been destroyed, there were, there were uh, questions about things that we knew had been created, but we couldn't prove that they'd been destroyed. So to say that the efforts of UN inspectors are incomplete should not be confused with uh, a judgment that the UN inspectors were very effective at understanding what the Iraqis did and uh, dismantling effectively the most dangerous programs, and I would cite the nuclear weapons program in particular. Uh, I think the majority uh, position, not only internationally but even inside the U.S. government in the, in the mid-1990s was that the nuclear account could basically be closed, which didn't mean that Iraq had lost interest in nuclear weapons, but uh, we were quite confident in the mid-1990s that this program had been contained, that uh, we could uh, detect significant activities, particularly in the nuclear weapons program that has such a uh, demand such uh, extensive infrastructure and has such a high profile. Um, this judgment was simply not reflected in the way that the uh, senior officials in the Bush administration uh, discussed the issue. And it's quite curious now that if one looks back at the statements made by Hans Blix, who was head of the, of the UN inspection effort during those months leading up to war, those are the statements which stand well the test of time. Blix was the one who was very careful to state what we knew and what we did not know and very careful not to jump to conclusions about what the other side had. He presented the facts and he uh, marshaled the new information to revise the facts as we went along, to revise our reporting on the facts as we went along. Uh, to compare now what Hans Blix said week after week and what the senior U.S. officials said week after week make very clear who was credible and who was trustworthy and who was, was uh, basically for political reasons uh, providing a misleading and inaccurate account of what was going on. And do you think that 
the media could have or should have recognized that uh, you know there was a disconnect there, or that they should have been challenging the effectiveness of the uh, the UN inspectors. I think that I think the media, uh, some members of the media were were doing their job. I mean, certainly the UN inspectors were accessible. Their reports were uh, readily available, uh, but I think the U.S. media and, and press was not particularly energetic at taking what the inspectors said and uh, highlighting that to the public, pointing out what, uh, what the inspectors said in terms of what the, the political leadership of the U.S. administration was saying and, and reconciling a difference. Just to give one example of, of how the press seemed to be asleep, when Secretary Powell addressed the U.N., Security Council on February 5th, 2003, and provided a, an extensive elaboration of the U.S. case against uh, Iraqi malfeasance and continued uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction program efforts. He did not mention a word about uranium from Africa. This had been stated by the President of the United States. In effect, highly sensitive information declassified uh, eight days before Powell's speech. It was, it was one of only two real components that the president presented to the public uh, to argue that Iraq is again reconstituting its nuclear weapons program. That, that Powell did not address at all one of the two uh, pieces of evidence that the president cited in his State of the Union message, one would think would send a very loud signal and would prompt the press to both point that out to the public and ask why Secretary Powell was not elaborating on one of the issues that was apparently so important that the president needed to, to uh, declassify this in front of the nation and the world. As far as I remember at the time, no one from the press pointed that out. There, were, there was a lot of salivating about how persuasive Secretary Powell was and uh, what, a, what a tremendous performance it was to present in great detail all this information. But not a word to, to mention the, the non-barking dog, so to speak, the, the obvious absence of something which one would think would raise questions about the president's credibility. That was before, of course, uh, information came in on the, the documents being forged and before the eventual retraction of the information by, by the president and his, and his cabinet. Where was the press? What were they doing? Were they all so busy? so busy embedding themselves in the U.S. military? Were they all so caught up with the, the Marshall uh, promos for the coverage of the upcoming war that they couldn't read that report and, and read it next to statements the president made eight days before? And not only that, on, on March 7th, when al came out and said there were forgeries, the U.S. at the same time said, we have a 10-day ultimatum, and that totally wiped out all the coverage. So. When you see, do you see any other public relations tactics that the administration was doing in a way to control the press? Or? It's hard to know what the right term is for the way that the administration uh, manipulated the press. Um, it was a very successful effort. Uh, the, the press was spending most of its energies um, covering this issue as, as if it were the upcoming Super Bowl. Uh, who's going to win? What are the U.S. military plans? Uh, there was the overriding assumption, I mean, all of us had the assumption that Saddam Hussein was a, was a tyrant, someone who had uh, uh, violated international law, uh, committed human rights atrocities, and so forth. But, but that background so overwhelmed uh, the coverage of this issue that the, the real hard analysis about what the facts are and what the actual danger being posed would be of continuing the UN inspections without actually invading the country, that uh, the, the press played right into the administration's game plan. Uh, accept the, the urgency of the threat, don't really ask too many questions about why this is so dangerous for the United States, why this is more dangerous for the United States than North Korea or Iran or one might say uh, uh, the war on terrorism, which um, I believe was, was weakened. Our pursuit of terrorists was weakened by going into Iraq. Al-Qaeda was not a threat in Iraq. 
It wasn't then, it's more of a threat now in Iraq. Al-Qaeda was, was uh, based in Afghanistan. Diverting soldiers and effort and translators and attention from Afghanistan weakened the pursuit of Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. So, uh, where, where, was the, where was the press analysis of the negative effect on the pursuit of, of the perpetrators of 9-11 by the invasion of Iraq? I didn't see much of an analysis in that area. And when you, yeah, uh, and when you uh, look at, uh, you were trying to submit an, an op-ed in, in January. Can you talk a little bit about your attempts to try to reach out to the press to try to kind of correct the record? In, in January, I submitted an op-ed to the Washington Post, and the theme of, of that op-ed was, was to try to raise warning flags about the way senior administration officials were using the term weapons of mass destruction. By using it as a mantra again and again, what they were doing was encouraging the public to see nuclear weapons, to see mushroom clouds, to focus on the one weapon of mass destruction that truly threaten our uh, national security and viability. But the evidence in Iraq was not in the nuclear field. The evidence, which was really uh, more uh, legitimate concerns than it was hard evidence of inventories, the evidence was in the biological and chemical fields. So I was trying to point out in this op-ed that uh, Weapons of mass destruction, as a term, is very dangerous. It's more dangerous than, than uh, uh, it's dangerous in a way that it doesn't imply. It's dangerous because it, it misinforms the, the public about what's being done. So I was trying to focus on manipulation of public fears and harnessing the, 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 the anxiety and the anger of 9-11 in a direction that did not logically follow. Uh, I had no success, and the Washington Post didn't have uh, time for this piece. I, I wrote another op-ed in February, immediately after the Secretary Powell's speech, pointing out the absence of any mention in his 85-minute elaboration of the uranium from Africa story. That op-ed was also uh, rejected. Um, I wrote uh, members of Congress. I, when Senator Warner said on television that uh, we have to trust the President of the United States, you know, I sent a letter to him reminding him that Ronald Reagan uh, said, trust but verify. Uh, you can trust the President of the United States, Senator Warner, but verify what he is saying uh, and, and what the National Intelligence Estimate says. Dig into it. Uh, it, it made no impact. So uh, these are modest efforts, of course, uh, and, uh, and I, I don't presume that I, I had uh, uh, an automatic, uh, that I should have had an automatic entry into, into this dialogue, except the fact that I was someone who had seen all of the relevant intelligence. And I was retired from government, and I was willing to share my view that that intelligence was being distorted, which I thought was a newsworthy, a newsworthy matter. Um, and indeed, the press did find it to be a very newsworthy matter once the invasion had occurred, and they found no weapons of mass destruction. So what did they tell you? Why, did they not want, why weren't they interested in these storylines? Um, just other things uh, were more important. Uh, 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 who said other things? Are well, the the manager of the, uh, the editorial page. I I I can't uh, provide a direct quotation, but you know, it was along the lines of what what anyone would say if 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 you don't have room for, or other things are, are more timely. And, and so I mean, the, I I don't want to make, do, be too presumptuous in this. I mean, I have no idea what other great op eds were were written at the time, but. Uh, my feeling was that it was a voice, uh, an informed voice, about what the intelligence said and how manipulation was occurring. That, that uh, unfortunately, it wasn't just me. I just didn't see it appearing, which is one of the things that motivated me to write the piece at the time. Okay, and when you look at you know taking a step back, and one of the failings of the press I see is this big question of why? Why are we going to war? Why now? And, and can you, from your sense, you know, what is the answer? Why did the United States, you know, Go to war with Iraq. The why of the war is one of the hardest questions to answer, and I'm afraid uh, the fact that I'm even saying this is a terrible comment. Uh, nations should always understand why they're going to war. The only thing we really know is that the reason stated uh, was was an inaccurate reason, and 
Uh, we know that, that, that Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction and that uh, its most serious, the, the most threatening program, nuclear weapons, had not really been reconstituted. So if we know that the causes belli that had been uh, announced was, was inaccurate, then what was it? I think it was a combination. It was, uh, it was partly this crusading zeal uh, on the part of, uh, of Wolfowitz and Pearl uh, to uh, create a new paradigm in the Middle East, to introduce democracy. Uh, that's the more high-minded of the ideals. It was partly uh, uh, to do Israel a favor, uh, to remove one of, the, one of the serious security concerns of Israel. It was partly uh, the real politique concern about uh, uh, the, the, the world's second largest oil reserves being held by a, a government which is hostile to the United States. Uh, it was partly a personal animosity between George W. Bush and Saddam Hussein. As Bush said, uh, this is the guy who tried to kill my father. So it was partly personal and partly vendetta. Uh, it was a combination of many issues. It's impossible for me to really say what, is, what percentage was more important than others. It's only possible for me to say since uh, a lot of the lobbying by the faction of neoconservatives that was ultimately successful had started long before 9-11. Uh, in fact, it started even before the Bush administration was elected uh, to believe that uh, those were the real reasons for going to war rather than WMD and the, the weapons, which uh, I think more or less was admitted by Wolfowitz that this was the one common denominator that everyone could agree on that the administration should present to the public. And when you look back now, the, the, the whole, you know, with the, the Senate report, the, the people on the right are trying to frame this as being the CIA's fault. It's all the CIA's fault, or uh, the intelligence community, that was a failure. And from your sense, did the intelligence that you saw really indicate a threat? I see uh, two failings in, in this whole uh, sorry story of intelligence, uh, the intelligence scandal uh, involving Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. The first failing, and, and I, should, I should clarify this, there are two uh, unjustifiable failings in the Iraqi intelligence story. The one failing that I'm somewhat sympathetic to is the mistakes that, that all of us made at the time, assuming for good reasons that Saddam had weapons. Saddam had lied about his programs in the past. We had caught him in, in uh, those lies. He had uh, produced biological and chemical weapons that were not acknowledged to the United Nations in the early days. Then through defectors, we basically caught him in the lie. Um, we knew that Saddam Hussein was obstructing the efforts of the UN inspectors, which certainly provided a prima facie case that he was being uncooperative in order to uh, cover up an ongoing program. So there were, there were reasons, I think there were understandable reasons to make assumptions about what was happening there. And so I'm, I'm a little more charitable in the intelligence community's failure to understand that Saddam seems to have been playing a double game. He was, he was deliberately trying to deceive the, the West about, uh, about having weapons to act as a deterrent while he was trying to convince the rest of the world that, that uh, the United States was picking on him unjustly and that the sanctions should be removed. We didn't really break the code on that, understand that there was a double game going on. Uh, that was regrettable, but I think is somewhat understandable. What is really inexcusable is what went beyond that, that the senior leadership of the intelligence community, and I'm, I'm thinking here mostly of the, the director of central intelligence, George Tennant, but also aided and abetted by the heads of the DIA and, and, uh, and the other agencies, took what the intelligence professionals were saying with all of their qualifications, with all of their uncertainties, and in the packaging of the intelligence estimates, they were putting additional spin on it. 
They were removing qualifiers. They were saying Iraq possesses when, in fact, the estimate said we assess that Iraq possesses. They were, in effect, providing a package that misled the Congress, the public, and even the senior administration officials on the actual extent of our knowledge about what Iraq was doing. So part of the blame goes for the leadership of the U.S. intelligence community. But also, if one looks at the White House, there was, first of all, no interest manifested by senior political leaders in this administration about what the weaknesses of the, inf uh, of the information were. When information was presented about doubts about this source or that source, it seemed to have no effect. What the, in what the political leadership was very definitely interested in is Give us all the information you have about a connection between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. Uh, they not only represented in an inaccurate way what the senior intelligence officials were saying to them, they even created like rogue intelligence organizations like the Office of Special <laughs> to cherry pick the information and, and use extensively the Iraqi National Congress and other sources that have an obvious motive for putting Saddam Hussein in the worst possible light and using that information as talking points to make an advocacy argument to the public rather than using intelligence to try to get at the bottom of what was happening. So I see uh, the senior administration